أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله تبارك وتعالى وسلم على سيدنا محمد سيدنا وسندنا وحبيبنا وشفيعنا ومولانا صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وأصحابه وأزواجه وضرياته وأهل بيته ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين وبعد I apologize. It's somewhat awkward to give a women's bayan from the men's section. Oftentimes it's part of the craft of speech to be able to craft your speech according to your audience, which is very difficult when you don't know who your audience is. But inshallah, there'll be some benefit nevertheless. I mentioned a hadith yesterday in the talk after Salat al-Asr, I believe, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said in the hadith of Sahih Bukhari, man yuridillahu bihi khayran yusib minhu. The person who Allah ta'ala wishes good for, he will afflict that person. <clears throat> this is a common misconception about life with people. And it is compounded amongst those who are ignorant of their deen which is the idea that just because you go through difficulty, somehow or another, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't like you, or you must be a sinner, or God must hate you. وَالْعِيَاذُ billah. I seek refuge in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, not necessarily because it's untrue. It may be true. But if it is true, the meaning is completely horrible. And even worse than that, is that it is completely unnecessary. There is a hadith Qudsi, that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa narrates from the Rabb tabarak wa ta'ala, from Allah ta'ala himself, that Allah ta'ala says, Ana inda dhani abdi bi. I am as my slave thinks of me. So if you believe that Allah ta'ala is there to persecute you, to make your life miserable, to make your life horrible, this is a sin. This su al dhan billah, This wal'iyadu billah, thinking ill of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this is a sin and the punishment of that sin is what? Is that bad thing that you think about Allah ta'ala, you make it, you make it true. You want to believe Allah ta'ala is a tyrant to, that's there to destroy you and to kill you and to make your life horrible? If that's what you want, if that's what you want, that's what you get. It's completely unnecessary, however. This is a sickness actually many non-Muslim religions have, and this is also a sickness that many people who ascribe to Islam, heterodox groups that claim Islam, they have as well. Su adhan billah. Why? Why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did this to me? Why Allah ta'ala did that to me? Why did our people suffer persecution for so many centuries? Why is this haram and why do I have to do this and why is this far that's going to ruin my life why is XYZ infallible imam guy somehow or another supposed to be the infallible imam but he's never able to make it to the caliphate why 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 it leads to suadhan billah but with people even within those who ascribe to guidance you see the mindset creeps into them and it's such a horrible mindset. It's such a nonsensical mindset. One thing, okay, something is horrible, but it's true, right? If, for example, you jump into a fire, it's going to burn you alive. It's horrible, but it is true. It's an objective truth. A person should know it in order to save themselves from that reality. The problem with this, this is something that we turn into a self-fulfilling prophecy. Allah Ta'ala is not there to harm you. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not there to get you. Imagine Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the one who has, you know, created the heavens and the earth from nothing, the one that there's no God except for him, 
the one that that the 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 visions cannot apprehend him even though he apprehends all the visions the one who's laysa kamithlihi shay the one that there's nothing like anything unto him the one who's lam yakul lahu kufu an ahad that there's nobody who is a, a, a match to him jalla wa ala laysa lahu diddun wala niddun he has no opposite nor does he have any rival or contender why are you and me going to somehow or another make his to-do list that we upset him so much that oh now he's going to make an enemy out of something like us imagine when's the last time one of the bacteria in your hand upset you so much that it became your enemy there's so many of them you can't even count you can't even see them they're so small if one of them behaves poorly versus the other one does it really make a difference to you it makes absolutely no difference to you the relationship between you and the bacteria on your hand is much closer than the relationship between you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, between me and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This idea is a wrong idea. Why, why me? Why is Allah ta'ala doing this to me? Why is Allah ta'ala doing that to me? This is an idea actually that's born out of certain dysfunctionalities of Christian theology as well. And there are many iterations in different traditions, but it's born out of many dysfunctionalities in Christian theology as well. Why? In Western Europe and the part of Western Europe that colonizes North America primarily, the Catholic Church, which had supremacy and hegemony over these parts, it wasn't the only form of Christianity, but it was by far the politically and culturally most dominant, mostly by facts of conquest and genocide, but that's a separate story. They used to, they used to cultivate and almost fetishize the idea of zuhud, the idea of doing without, the idea of turning your back on the dunya to extremes. To such extremes, you would have monks that would not shower for years. Why? Because wearing clean clothes, being clean, these things are extravagances of the dunya. And they have this idea, for example, I don't know if you remember like the Pope John Paul, two popes ago, he was like in debilitating pain and he didn't retire. He kept suffering, kept suffering. He wouldn't give up the post of being Pope. Why? One of the things that he said is that I identify with the suffering of Christ. Of course, we know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told us in his book, they didn't kill him and they did not crucify him. So what you're identifying with, according to our theology, has nothing to do with Christ at all, alayhi salam. It has nothing to do with Sayyidina Isa alayhi salam at all. And it's interesting, it's interesting. I don't know of any major group that made the claim that Sayyidina Isa alayhi salam was not crucified before Islam. But it works out a number of theological problems, not the least of which is that all three relig religious traditions have to grapple with the fact that Sayyidina Isa alayhi salam claimed that he was, he was what? He was, uh, he was the Masih, he was the Messiah. The Jews say that he wasn't the Messiah because the Messiah is foretold to do all of these things and he did none of them. Plus, they killed him like a criminal. Billah. The Christians say, no, no, he's the Messiah. So the Jews say to the Christians, how could he be the Messiah? He didn't do any of the things that are foretold in, in, in biblical prophecy. And on top of that, they killed him as a criminal. Billah. He's not supposed to get killed as a criminal. So the Muslims say, what? He didn't die. This works out this theological problem. At any rate, coming back to the Pope, he says, I identify with the suffering of Christ, which is what? This idea that somehow or another, the highest form of virtue the highest form of virtue is to be miserable because if christ billah if christ is the pinnacle of virtue is god himself billah then to identify with his suffering and the best thing that he did was suffering this is a dysfunctional mindset you see when i said before that it's not just one group right it's the same thing the rawfid amongst the amongst the muslims they say we believe in 12 infallible imams but they really don't like any of them they don't like Sayyidina ali radiallahu anhu why because he took bay i would say abu Bakr. he took bay i would say Umar. he took bay i would say uthman radiallahu ta'ala anhum he didn't make mukhalafa he didn't go against them in really anything that they did he actually participated with them so it's very dysfunctional so they they don't like this about him. They don't like Sayyidina Hassan radiallahu ta'ala and who, why? Because he also uh, took bay'ah with uh, Sayyidina Mu'awiyah radiallahu anhu. He literally gave the caliphate up to him. So you hear them talk sideways about him, even though they claim he's like the infallible imam. 
They don't like really any of the Imams. Why? Because first of all, they're all Sunnis and they all did stuff like this, which caused really problematical, problematic and difficult, uh, you know, uh, difficult conundrums for them to explain. The only one that they like is who? Sayyidina Hussain radiallahu anhu. And the only one thing that he did that they like is that he died. Why? Because you get to get back into this mindset of what? Suffering is fetishized. Suffering is somehow like the goal of, of all human beings and it's the pinnacle of virtue. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala negates this extremely pessimistic view, extremely psychiatrically dysfunctional view in his book. He says, Taha, ma anzalna alayka al Quran li tashqa. Ya Muhammad alayka salatu wa salam. We didn't reveal the Quran to you so that you can be wretched. The point of the deen is not so that everyone else has fun and you're, you're barred because it's all haram. The point of the deen is not everybody else is beautiful and you're ugly. The point of the deen is not that everybody else is strong and you're weak. The reason we accept this is Islam, our forefathers accepted this Islam, the companions of Allah Ta'ala and whom accepted this Islam is what? Is because it's the khair of this world and the hereafter. It makes you a better human being. You have more fun. You become more beautiful. You become more strong. Everything, everything that's good to be had, you have more of it through this Islam than you would otherwise. So this is a, a, a problematic and mistaken way of thinking about things that somehow or another, we have to intentionally make everything horrible, otherwise you're not a good Muslim. Because what's going to happen? There are some crazy people who will like literally sabotage their entire lives and purposely make their life completely horrible. Why? Because they think this is the right thing to do and it's not. In this world, sometimes they have the realization, if not, they'll have it on the hereafter, that I just, this was just an exercise in self-flagellation. I just tortured myself for no reason. It didn't have to be this way. But then on the other, on the other, and what happens is that most people actually are not even that pious. They don't really actually love Islam that much. What the, what's going to end up happening? They make a negotiation and a settlement with themselves inside their own mind that they say, you know, I'm not that pious. I'm still a Muslim, so I'll still like say Eid Mubarak to people on Eid, and I'll say, still say Wa Alaikum Asalaam. And if everybody else is praying around me, there's no harm in praying a little bit. But I'm not going to pray too much. Why? Because then I'll be pious and then I'll suffer and then I'll be wretched. And nobody wants to be wretched. The fitrah Allah Ta'ala created people who have a sound mind is nobody wants to be wretched. Nobody wants to like live a life just of suffering. And that's a good thing in my contention. But the problem is then one extreme, the pendulum, when it goes too far one, one side, what's going to happen? It's going to inevitably swing hard to the other side. So then you have the, the worship of pleasure, the worship of enjoyment, the idea that no, enjoyment is the only thing that's, that, that's good. In fact, the fact that you're enjoying, the fact that you're uh, having a fun time, a good time, this becomes fetishized and this becomes the marker of righteousness and piety, which is what the Protestants did. The Protestants are what? They are a, a kind of a rebel faction of the Catholic Church. The Catholic Church is what they branched off from. So in particular, in North America, they have a strain of Protestantism called the Prosperity Gospel, born out of a theological contention of Calvinists, of what they refer to as the uh, Protestant work ethic. The idea that, no, the point of religion is that you should have a good life. Therefore, if you're rich, this is a sign God loves you and he's blessing you for your piety. If you're enjoying yourself, this is a sign God loves you and he's rewarding you for your piety. If you're poor, this is a sign that you're a bad person and God is punishing you for your wickedness. Again, this is another extreme. If this was true, then Elon Musk, they should worship him. Some of them, some of them actually do. Really, some of them actually do. Some kids, Muslim kids actually do. That's why crypto, the whole crypto wave was like a religious experience for even many Muslim kids that are not really connected to deen. I know kids, they were like, mashallah, like students of knowledge. They made a massive amount of money off of the crypto trade. I'm not a mufti. I'm not giving you a fatwa. I one time in public expressed some sentiment on my own behalf that there are certain elements of the way like Bitcoin work and things like that, that I don't understand how can this be permissible in the... Sharia of Islam, but I'm not a mufti, go get your fatwa from a mufti. If someone can explain to me these problematic issues in it, then that would be great. But no one's been able to explain it to me yet. And it's not because I don't understand how the blockchain works or whatever. When the price of, when the price of Bitcoin was like flying in the air and people who put in $100 are now walking around with $1,000 per, per coin or whatever. 
$10,000, right? At that time, when I would say something about crypto, you're an idiot, you're backwards, you're the reason that Ummah is this, you're this, blah, 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 blah. And then when the price of the Bitcoin comes down, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, uh, I, I was rude to you, Sheikh. Why you, can, <laughs> you can't, Dean cannot work that way. I might be wrong, it's fine. I didn't, again, I said, I'm not a Mufti, I'm not giving you a fatwa. If you ask me, for example, simple Masail, can you walk in front of somebody who's praying? No. Can you walk in front of a muqtadi who's praying behind another imam? Yes. These masail, I'll tell you. Some complicated things, we leave them to the experts or at least we get together with uh, other people who have some knowledge and discuss them and deliberate over them before, you know, giving our opinions like as if it's like the, the last word. But the idea is this, is that this fetishization of enjoyment of wealth, pleasure of the enjoyable experiences of this world, this is also theology and it's also dysfunctional. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says what in his book? He says, he says, he says, As for a human, if his Lord tests him, his Lord tests him and he honors him with wealth, he'll say, oh, look how much my Lord has honored me. Look, I have money, therefore God loves me. I have money, Allah Ta'ala loves me. This is the, the, the line of reasoning. And if, and if he should test him in a different way, he constricts his, he constricts his uh, provisions. Then he says, oh look, my Lord has humiliated me. What is the response of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to this line of thinking? One word, kalla. No, no way. Verily, indeed, no. This is completely 100% incorrect. Just one word. No, 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 need to, no need to understand what the nature, the hukam on such a line of thinking is beyond that. It makes absolutely no sense if you read the Qur'an and the stories of the Prophet ﷺ in the Qur'an. If you read the stories of the Prophet ﷺ, even in the Bible, even in the Gospels, even in, the, in, in the, the scriptures of those who came from before us. You tell me, if the point of being righteous is to suffer, then who in the hell in the right mind is going to want to be righteous? Again, there may be some people here, you should go see a psychiatrist. They make medicine for things like this. It's not, it's like, it's a psychiatric equivalent of having like a broken leg. You should get a cast because it's not right. This is not normal. To be patient with your adversity is different, but I'm saying to actually want adversity, this is a curse. This is completely wrong. It's completely horrible. It's, you don't see any of the Anbiya alayhim salam that were like that. You don't see any of the awliya and salihin that were like that. Some people say, oh, but fulan wali is like that, but maybe they're not a wali at all. Why? Because this is a dysfunctionality. This is an interesting thing actually in Muslim cultures. It's, uh, we're a bit removed from it in North America, but in Muslim cultures, oftentimes when they hear about the suffering of righteous people in the past and their patience with their suffering, they start to think that what? The good thing is the suffering. The good thing wasn't the suffering. The good thing was the patience. Otherwise, nobody, nobody wants to suffer intentionally. What's the other extreme? That somehow suffering is a sign of wickedness? Somehow suffering is a sign of impiety and it's a punishment from Allah Ta'ala. This is also wrong. Why? Because Allah Ta'ala gave so much victory in Madad and Nasr to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He gave Madad and Nasr to the Ummah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He came to the aid of so many of the Anbiya Alayhim Wasallam. Many of them were Shaheed, but many of them also Allah Ta'ala saved them. Sayyidina Isa Alayhi Wasallam, بَرَّفَعَهُ اللَّهُ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saved Sayyidina Ilyas from his qawm that reverted to idolatry after their, after their repentance and uh, worship of Allah alone. Allah ta'ala gave victory to Sayyidina Dawood over uh, Jalut alayhi salam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave victory to Sayyidina Sulaiman alayhi salam. Allah ta'ala gave victory to so many of the, uh, of the Anbiya alayhi salam and so many of the pious and righteous people. What is it a sign that they're not pious people? And out of all of the people to believe in the prosperity gospel, the dumbest group of people is what? Is the Christians. Why, how, how can you believe that somehow or another God punishes the wicked with poverty and with suffering? When the one who suffered the most in your, in your imagination and in your uh, theology is who? God himself, 
That makes absolutely no sense whatsoever. It's just one extremism being a result of another. Look in Islam. What did the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said? He said, Shaddu nasi bala'an. Al anbiya'u thum al amthalu fal amthalu. Those people who have the most suffering, the most difficulty, the most tribulation, the most severe tri tribulation, the most intense tribulation, are the Prophets السلام, then those who are most like them, and then those who are most like them. So right now, until this point, mashallah, I've said, okay, this is wrong and that's wrong, but we should also talk about then what's right. It's wrong to fetishize suffering, to believe that suffering is somehow itself righteousness. Many people suffer because of their own wickedness and their own stupidity. On the flip side, it's wrong to fetishize enjoyment, wealth, and afia to the point where you think that somehow or another suffering is wickedness. Rather, the model that the Quran lays out for the believers and the model of, that the Sunnah of the Messenger of Allah وسلم, lays out for the believers is as such. That that no, no affliction has afflicted you. Except for bima kasabat nas, except for the deeds that people's hands have earned. an kathir, and Allah subhanahu wa taala, He forgives many things, even on top of that. Now, this sounds like a very menacing and threatening ayah, doesn't it? Right? That it's your fault, you did it. It's your fault that you're getting punished. It's your fault that you're suffering. In fact, in fact, the companions really Allah taala anhum. When they heard this verse, they rejoiced. They say this is one of the most, this is one of the most hopeful verses of the Quran. This is one of the verses that gave us the most joy. Why? Because they're not thinking about only the dunya, they're thinking about the akhirah. This verse, the kum here, the, the, the addressee, the mukhatab, the mukhatab, mukhatabun of this verse is not everyone. It's just the Muslims, it's just the believers. And the significance of the verse that made them happy was what is that your tribulations that you suffer Allah Ta'ala will clear them out of the way in this world so that you don't have to face them in the hereafter this is one of the blessings that Allah Ta'ala gave to this ummah that we would suffer one of the reasons people say well why do Muslims suffer so much compared to everybody else one of the reasons Muslims seem to suffer so much compared to everyone else is we suffer a little bit in this world so that our slates are clean by the time we get to, by the time we get to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is one of the reasons, not the only reason. Whereas the kuffar, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will protect them from suffering in this world because of their kuffar, he'll punish them for it in the hereafter. For the Muslims, the hereafter is better and lasts forever and is better than this world. So the mafum al mukhalaf is what? For the kafir, that the akhirah should also be sharr and abqa. It should be sharr al lakamin al ula. That the, the, the hereafter is what? It's going to be more evil, it's going to be more horrible than this world. It will be more horrible than the hereafter. They say one of the great ulama, I believe it's attributed to Sayyidina Isa bin Abdul Salam rahimahullah ta'ala, but I'm not 100% sure. They say that once he came out wearing his, his vestments of the people of knowledge, beautiful clothes, bagri, jubba, shubba, unguti, lati, everything, he's on his white horse and he's riding through Cairo like, you know, Isa bin Abdul Salam is, they called him the Sultan al ulama as if he was like a second Sultan in the country because the, he had an agreement with the government that they're not going to touch him and they're not going to overrule any of his rulings. So he was, he was walk, going on his horse through the streets of Cairo and a, 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 a Yehudi, a Jewish oil seller, he was selling a cart, selling lamp oil in it. So the oil, when it gets into your clothes, you can't wash it out easily and it's just really tedious and it's hot and it's just a difficult job to do. So he stops and he says, Shaykh, I have a question for you. So yeah, go ahead. He says, you Muslims, don't you have a hadith that you narrate from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? That the dunya is the, is the, the sijin, is the prison of the believer and it's the paradise of the kafir. He says, yeah, yeah, that's true. He says, you explain to me what kind of sijin, what kind of prison are you in? You're on your white horse and like looking nice and wealthy and happy. And what kind of paradise am I in? He says, you have to understand, in order to understand this hadith, you have to understand the akhirah. 
if I think of what Allah Ta'ala has prepared for a believer in Jannah, then I can only consider this to be a prison. And if I think of what Allah Ta'ala has prepared for a kafir in the hereafter, I can only consider what you're doing right now to be a paradise. The issue is that they rejoiced. Why? Because they, they, they took this as a sign from Allah Ta'ala that any sin that you have, it's going to be cleared away in this world. And then you'll come to Allah Ta'ala with a clear slate because of the fact that you were sick, because of the fact that you had a heart attack, because of the fact that you, you know, got into a car accident, because of the fact someone, your business partner cheated you, because of the fact that this thing happened, that thing happened, uh, you know, because of the suffering of those things, Allah Ta'ala will clear your state and you come to Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala only with your good deeds free from the shackles of your sins. But even then, this is an incomplete understanding. Remember the hadith Qudsi that we talked about? I am as my slave thinks of me. Now you tell me, you tell me, when you repent for a sin, what happens? You sincerely repent for a sin, what happens? Do you know? You did something bad, right? You like, I don't know. You were supposed to fast. And instead of fasting and praying, you ate a bag of Cheetos. The next day you're like, wow, that was really bad. That was really bad. I'm, I'm ashamed of this. Yeah, Allah, I'm ashamed of myself for doing that. I'll make up the fast. I'll pay the penalty for, for having, having violated the fast. And I promise I won't do this again. Now in that moment, obviously you don't say these sentences. It's a feeling inside the heart. It all happens at once, right? In that moment, how long will it take for Allah to forgive you? Do you know? Do you know? It's okay to say I don't know. Allah Ta'ala forgives you right away. You don't, you, it even doesn't take the amount of time for that feeling to turn into words. As soon as that feeling comes in the heart, this is like your receipt that Allah has forgiven you. Ask yourself, people, Shaykh, does, did Allah Ta'ala accept my repentance? I say, look, the, if you feel bad about it, so bad that you wish you never did that thing, then this, is your, this feeling is like a receipt that Allah Ta'ala already has forgiven you. Now, why is it that you don't believe that? Right? In order to get to Jannah, the condition is not that you forgive yourself. The condition is who forgives you? Allah forgives you. If you don't want to forgive yourself, that's your problem. Go get a therapist. Don't talk to me about it. I already told you the mas'ala. The rest is your own psychiatric problems. Go get a therapist and pay him. Pay her. Several dollars an hour in order to work it out. Because once you're paying money out of your own pocket, you figure out stuff easier. But when Mulana Saab does it, free sabilillah, right, then people take their time, you know, figuring these things out. You will pay a therapist about it. I already told you the mas'ala. Allah Ta'ala has forgiven you already. You say, oh, but, 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 no, no, but. Allah Ta'ala, Allah Ta'ala forgave you. That's it. It's done. Why is it difficult for people to understand? So imagine this. Someone is going through suffering. I mean, there are things that happen to human beings in life. Okay, someone has something horrible. You know, Allah protect us all from all of these things. Everyone has to die one day, but Allah give us afiyah as long as we're alive. Someone has to suffer from a debilitating disease, a chronic disease, cancer. Somebody lost all of their money. Someone lost all of their loved ones or some one of their loved ones. They lost their spouse. They lost their children. They lost their parents. They lost this. They lost that. The most beloved thing in this world, they lost it. And they come with profound amounts of suffering. And then what happens? Oh, what did I do? It's my sins. It's my sins. But if it's your sins, repent. But I already repented. Okay, then why are you saying it's your sins then? Now, is this a, is this a, a aqidah issue anymore? Or is it a, a psychiatric issue? Does this, is this an issue that has to do with your Islam? Or is this an issue that has to do with your own problems, your own mental hangups? This is a problem. This is a problem. And what ends up happening again is because we are failed to understand what the greatness of Allah Ta'ala is and the fact that He forgives a person without compunction. It doesn't cost Him anything. He loves to forgive a person more than a person loves to, more than a person uh, loves to be forgiven. Literally, there's athar that, that, that say that what? If you didn't sin, Allah Ta'ala would replace you with another people who would sin and then ask Him for forgiveness. I mean, I don't make it up. You can ask, Mufti Saab is right there. You can ask your ulama, is this guy come from America and he's making these things up or are these hadith actually there in the corpus? You can go ask, inshallah, if you don't believe me. But the point is, is what? Is that this idea inside of your mind that, that it's because of your sins. If it was because of your sins, it's because, because of your sins until you repent. Sometimes people don't repent. The first moment of anguish when you're going through difficulty, that itself is a kafara for your 
difficulty. Everything else after that is what? Allah Ta'ala is raising your rank, raising your rank, raising your rank. So the point of this bayan, which has already gone on too long, I wanted it not to go above half an hour, and we're at 29 minutes and 47 seconds. The khulasa is what? The khulasa is what? You have a lot of problems. I have a lot of problems in life. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not one of them. Allah Ta'ala is the only one thing that's going right in your life. It's the only one thing that's going right in my life. That's the only one thing that's in our favor. But glad tidings, Bushra lakum, Azimushan khush khabri, that what? It's the only thing you need. It's the only thing you need. If it's Allah Ta'ala is going right with you, whatever difficulties you're going through, if it hurts, it's okay to say it hurts and it's difficult for me to bear the pain. But don't say that this is somehow or another a punishment from Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala because it's obviously not. Your receipt that it's not a punishment from Allah is what? Do you say La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah? If the answer is yes, then this is a sign that this is actually something that's going to work out in your favor one day. And that day it will, be, it will be a glorious day and it will be a day that you're happy. So don't look around at other people and say, well, how come this person has this car? How come this person has these clothes? How come this person has this money? How come this person got this spouse? How come this person got this thing that I wanted? And that person got that thing I wanted. If they're a good person, Allah gave it to them because of his love. And if Allah loves you, he'll give it to you or something better to you as well. Just say mashallah about other people's things and ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to also give you from his fadl as well. All of us will get it one day and we'll get it at the, at the time and in the place that it's best for us. There are some people, Allah gives them poverty and difficulty. Why? Because if you had health and you had wealth, you would go off the rails. Some, some of us, Allah Ta'ala gave, make us poor. Why? Because he loves us. Because if we had a billion dollars in the bank account, we would be partying on a weird island somewhere. Some of us, Allah gave us money. Why? Because if we were poor, we wouldn't be able to hold on to our iman. So he gave us enough money in this world. So what? And enough comfort in this world so that we wouldn't go off the rails. All of it, Allah knows and you don't know. So have some confidence in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's choice for you. Repeat this to yourself that Allah ta'ala's knowledge is greater than my knowledge. Allah ta'ala's choice for me is greater and more beloved to me than my choice for myself. It will give you solace. It will make you feel better. And it will also correct a number of unhealthy and harmful notions. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us all tawfiq. Wa sallallahu tabaraka wa ta'ala. Wa sallam ala sayyidina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Are there any questions? I feel bad. This is supposed to be the sister's bayan and I have no ability or vehicle or medium by which to receive questions if somebody wants to run something down in the next couple of minutes you can do so are there any questions from the brother's side since you're around jazakumullah khairan yeah go ahead So the, 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 the question, if I understood properly for those who cannot hear is, okay, a person when they feel bad and they resent, they, uh, they feel bad and they feel nadama, they feel regret for their sins, then you know Allah forgive you. But what about a person who has the feeling that, okay, I know Allah is going to forgive me so that I don't sin or so that I don't stop myself from sinning the next time. And uh, look, these are two different things. Okay. For example, think about something that's haram. Allah protect us, right? For example, drinking alcohol is haram. A person drinks and then they repent. And then the thought comes to my, their mind next time they want to get drunk is that Allah will forgive me. Uh, the abuse of Allah's mercy. The fact that he forgives you based on true uh, regret. Then the thought that crosses a person's mind that, well, I'll just do it again because he'll forgive me again. This is a sin that's bigger than the drunkenness itself. It also requires repentance. Until you repent from that sin, then this type of dysfunctional behavior and thinking it's going to persist inside of a person's heart. That being said, that being said, not every repentance is easy. Not all bad habits are easy. Imagine, I gave the example of alcohol. Alcohol is an addiction. 
the, the physiology of addiction, the psychology of addiction, they are something worth studying and worth understanding. These sins don't let you go easily. There's a hikaya, hikaya in, uh, in one of Molana Rumi's, I believe in the Fihi Ma Fihi, about a, uh, um, about a maktab teacher and his students. The maktab teacher, as maktab teachers oftentimes are, maybe also in Toronto, uh, he was not very wealthy. So it was cold in the winter and he had no coat. So he was walking with his students and so he saw the carcass of a bear. And so he said, the students said, oh look, there's a dead bear over there. Why don't you grab the bear and you can skin it and make a jubba out of it for yourself. You'll become warm. And so he walked over to the bear and he tried to move the car carcass and he realized it's still alive and it attacked him. And so, so the students are screaming from a distance. They're saying, they're saying, Ustad, Ustad, let go of the jacket. He says, I'm trying to take the jacket, but it's not coming off. Some sins are like that. You have to struggle about it. So if you try and you fail the struggle, like imagine a person is addicted to alcohol, a person is addicted to drugs, a person is addicted to a hundred different things a person can get addicted to, right? A person can get addicted to another human being. You fall in love with somebody and they're completely horrible. <laughs> the complete shaitan is complete witch, completely horrible person, but you cannot let go. All of these things, they require a lot of struggle and oftentimes not everybody's going to be successful in getting rid of them the first time. You have to, it's going to one, two, three, it's going to take a hundred times, a thousand times to get rid of them. But you always have to hold on to this, hold on to the struggle inside of your heart. Just because it's not happening right away doesn't mean that your repentance isn't sincere. It just takes time sometimes. And so what happens, people give up. They say, oh, I made Toba and Allah forgave me, but oh, look, I'm doing it again. Therefore, nothing i'm just going to now like go back to the wine bottle this is this is stupid this is you're going to fail everything in life you're going to fail after you're the age of three years old things become more difficult and complicated than that uh so but it doesn't also mean the fact that a person commit the same sin again and again it doesn't mean that your repentance isn't sincere i know those people for the example of alcohol those people who live around us many of them are alcoholics they're just functional alcoholics many of them are dysfunctional alcoholics and then they see a Muslim, in particular, they see the beard, they see the, all of this. They know that we don't drink. You know why they know? Because those people hate alcohol more than we hate it. For us, it's just haram. We pass by it and it's like we blind our eyes to it and we don't look at it. Maybe there are some people in this gathering right now who have been alcoholics before or are still alcoholics. Don't admit your sins in front of one another. But those people will tell you how evil alcohol is because they know, they've, they've experienced it. It's not just an abstract piece of understanding on a far off distance. People come up to me, random people come up to me. They say, is it true you're Muslim? You guys don't drink? I'm like, yeah. He's like, oh man, that's boring. You guys don't have fun. I'm like, if, that's, if destroying your brain is fun for you, you go ahead and uh, you know, knock yourself out, bro. Yeah, you're right. You know, because of alcohol, I lost my job. I lost my wife. I lost my children. I lost my parents. I lost this. I lost that. This person hates me. That person hates me. I don't have a driver's license. I don't have a business. I don't have, they took my this license away. They took that license away. I, 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 got, I didn't finish school. I didn't this. I didn't this. And I'm like, like, that sounds utterly horrible. Like, why in the hell would anyone like that? Yeah, you're right, bro. Can I tell you something? When I drink, I see the devil and it scares the heck out of me. I'm like, wow, that sounds like a really good reason not to drink ever again. They know how horrible it is even more than the person who has never sinned before. So yes, those people, when they want to give it up, they struggle a lot and they fail a lot. We should, instead of anything else, if you see someone struggling and they failed, you should console them and give them some courage. Say, inshallah, try again. It will be better next time. I promise. I'm there with you. You know, next time you feel like reaching for the bottle, call me. We'll go out and have a pizza. We'll go out and do this. We'll go and, we'll go and eat, uh, eat, eat carbs and we won't tell Sheikh about it because he's going to yell at us if he finds out. You know, we'll go do all of those fun things, inshallah. I'll, you know, I'll, I'm there to help you with it. But don't ever think that just because, uh, you know, you lapse into the sin again, that somehow or another Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not forgiving you or your repentance is not sincere or this or that or that. No, those are very sincere repentances. It's just that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to test you another time. And every time he tests you, he sees again. And can you imagine that? Imagine that on the day of judgment. We beat up ourselves a lot. But imagine on the day of judgment, a person made a tawbah from something 10,000 times. And Allah accepted every single one of them. Every one of them is a separate good deed. 
Can you imagine that this human being was in this world and he never gave up struggle for the sake of Allah Ta'ala? And Allah gave him tests that, that he knew he wasn't going to be able to pass, but he still didn't give up. That will be awesome. You'll see the great maqam of those people. La uqsimu bin nafsil lawama. You'll see the great maqam of those people in this world, even though sometimes we ourselves look at them like they're nothing and we scoff at them. The person who holds on to the, the, who, who holds on to the, uh, 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 the, 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 the handhold of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's mercy, that person is a great person. Maybe a person who didn't ever drink and never committed zina and never, you know, felt this way. That person, they think that they're a pious person, but their maqam is low in front of Allah ta'ala compared to that. So yes, which is in line with the, 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 the rest of the talk, that don't ever think that the struggle is somehow or another useless. The struggle is, uh, it's itself the reason that you're there. It's itself what piety is supposed to be. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepted from us all. I mean, yeah. And by the way, the rest of you, I feel bad that the I'tikaf guys maybe are like imprisoned in this bayan. The rest of you, I won't feel bad if you have to go. Go ahead. Sure. Go ahead. Yeah. So the question is, what if you have doubts about, oh, maybe like, you know, there's some, some impurity in my clothes or I didn't make wudu exactly right or whatever, will Allah accept? These are a couple of separate things. You have to separate them in your mind. They're different issues that people confuse them. One is, is the Salat valid or not? This is a fiqh issue. Is the Salat va like legally valid? So for example, Sheikh, I didn't make wudu, you know, I went to the bathroom, I didn't make wudu and then I prayed. Is my prayer valid legally? say no it's not and then those legal questions they become very complicated sometimes like well i think i made wudu but then this happened and that happened and now i'm confused right so the easy way of dealing with those things is okay well when you have doubts like that that are genuinely confusing just make wudu and pray again uh, the problem is some people their psychiatric makeup is such that this is not a solution because what happens is some people will make wudu like 30 times like literally without exaggeration they'll pray the same salat 30 times because they always have doubts if you find yourself doing that, like taking like four hours to make wudu or like repeating a prayer, like, you know, you know, more than once, like every day of your life or whatever, at that point, you should probably see, see a mental health expert because this is not a fit issue anymore. This is a mental health issue. It doesn't mean that you're crazy or you're a bad person, but this is a thing that happens to people and there, you need to just like find a professional to help you work through it. And there are many ulama in Toronto, right? Do you know, give me some names. Do you know some of the, I know I meet these guys all the time that graduate from, from Madrasa. They know, mashallah, a great amount of uh, fiqh and things like that. And they also are like licensed therapists. You can go talk to them, inshallah. If you ask an unlicensed person like me, I'll just be like, shut up and don't do it again. Like, but like those people will know how to help you, right? Um, so that's one thing is the legal validity. Acceptance is completely different though. You could literally do the prayer 100% perfect. All the sunnas. Your wudu is like seventh degree black belt, halal organic certified wudu. Uh, you know, like your gold platinum member status. And Allah, I won't accept it from you. The secret of acceptance is different than legal validity. It's different. You have to separate them in your mind. What is the secret of acceptance? Allah Ta'ala divulges it in his book. Innama yataqabbal Allahu minal muttaqeen. Allah Ta'ala doesn't accept from anyone except for the one who fears him. So that has to do with the state of the heart. The fact that a person is asking this question is your receipt that you have some degree of the fear of Allah Ta'ala. So a person should feel good about that. In fact, in fact, a person might actually be saying their prayer is wrong, legally invalidly, I should say. But Allah accepts the good deed from them. That doesn't waive the legal obligation. Imagine a person didn't know, you know, they completely didn't know anything about Islam, so they've been praying without wudu for the last like 30 years. If you go to the mufti, the mufti will tell you, and they should tell you, you have to make wudu and repeat all your prayers. But it doesn't mean that the prayers are wasted. Maybe on the day, and the person dies right there. On the day of judgment, if Allah Ta'ala accepts it from them because they did it out of sincerity, this is not far-fetched and this is not something that we don't believe as a possibility. So separate two things, the legal validity and the acceptability in front of Allah Ta'ala. These are two separate things. And then there's a third thing also is reward. How much reward will a person receive from, for something? You can do something validly and get absolutely no reward for it. 
This is when we say something is makruh, right? There are certain types of makruh that, that you know, if like the salat becomes makruh at that time, the fast becomes makruh, etc. There are certain things you can do that will legally not invalidate the salat and they will legally not invalidate the fast or whatever other good deed a person is doing, but they will make them legally valid but void of reward. What's the point of it? It means that you don't have to repeat the prayer, but you're not getting any, you wasted all the reward for it, right? Or another thing a person could do, mashallah, the same prayer that they pray and they'll get 700 times or more than that, the reward that the next guy who prays the same prayer does. And that has to do with a whole separate set of things from what we were talking about before as well. But you have to separate all, all of these three things. You have to separate all of these three, three things. Yeah, so this is great, mashallah. Someone asked now about forgiveness. What if your forgiveness involved wronging somebody else? Allah Ta'ala forgives sins, but He doesn't forgive debts. So if you owe someone $50 and you haven't paid them for like 20 years, and you say, Yeah, Allah, this is really horrible of me. I'm bad. I, you know, I'm, I make repentance for being this way, you know? then Allah accepts the repentance, but you still got to give them the $50 back. Otherwise, you're doing the same sin again, right? So that's, that's all that is. Allah Ta'ala forgives, forgives sins, but He doesn't forgive debts. You have to pay your debts. This is another interesting thing, the dysfunctionality about the theology of the Christians, which is what they say that what? If you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, then you're forgiven for all of your sins. Um, other than the shirk part of it, the other dysfunctionality is what? People do horrible things to one another. They destroy and sabotage one another horribly, but then they go on Sunday to church and then they come back forgiven the Holy Ghost and all this other stuff and that's done, right? Um, this is really harmful. There are a lot of people, one of the reasons this is society, the, the, so many people have left Christianity is because what? Because they are the victims of the person who's been forgiven, the person who like ripped off and cheated, lied, steal, harmed. Uh, uh, everybody else and like made facade in their entire family, everything, those people then they repent and then what happens, everybody else is like, well, I still have these problems that you caused me and you're repenting and you're living your life, nothing bad happened to you. You wronged everyone else, but you're just fine. And like, I still have these problems and you don't even care. You don't even help me. You don't even do anything for it. If this is your religion, this we don't we need this religion. I saw this actually. There is a, 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 a village in Bosnia called Ahmici in which it was half Croat and half uh, Bosnian. The Croats one day, uh, in a coordinated attack, basically after Fajr, they, uh, uh, while the men were in the masjid praying, they went and like shot up and killed the men. And then they went house to house, like basically raping and killing the women. And uh, by the time the Muslims realized what was going on, and they were friends, like they weren't even at war. Um, by the time the Muslims realized what was going on, like it was too late, like a, a great number of them died and like it was just complete, like completely horrible. We went and visited Ahmici, we went and visited the place, the masjid, they rebuilt it and they had a picture of the old masjid, how they bombed it and rocketed it and all this other nonsense. Um, and the Imam of the masjid told us, he said that uh, uh, the, one of the ringleaders of the Croats, they, because they, they, it was a really bad crime, it was well documented, so the UN, they... Uh, I guess they like sentenced the, the leaders of that, that uh, attack to like 10 years in jail or some like slap on the wrist type punishment, right? And then they let him off for good behavior early. And this is one of the ringleaders of this. Imagine raping and killing, raping and killing women and children, destroying a place of worship, all of this, right? So the guy apparently when he became, uh, when he was in jail, he like whatever, uh, uh, became a born again Christian. And now he's, he says he's a preacher. He has like, like a following and a TV show and all this other stuff. I go, has he ever come and asked you guys for forgiveness? He goes, not even once. He goes, we don't care anymore. We like, don't pay attention. It doesn't even bother us. We've moved on from it, but you know, but uh, I, I asked, did, did any of them ever come and say like, we're sorry we did this thing? He said, not, a, not one of them. If this is God's forgiveness, this is a curse. This is not a blessing, right? And so, it affects people, it drives them away from Christianity. You know how I know? You know how I know? I have a wife. She, told, she, she, she said this. She's, uh, she, she tells people, like, how did you become Muslim? They ask her. And she says, she says, because I grew up and, like, I saw these people who are, like, literally, like, like abusers. 
and then they would go to church and like feel like they're forgiven and all the people they abused and broke over their lives they're still like suffering problems they don't ask them do you need any help they don't ask them say sorry nothing they just leave them in the dust afterward and she said that she said i love church i was the most religious person in my family She's, because she's been Muslim for so many years, still her family members, if they have questions about the Bible, they'll call her and ask her. But what happened, she says, I thought, like, this is like, this is ridiculous, I can't be a part of this. So she left. Then what happened, years later, someone was telling her about Islam, yeah, we believe God, God forgives all sins. She's like, that's nonsense. Why would God forgive all sins? Because some people, you know, they abuse one another and this and that. And why would God forgive that? Like, that would just make society horrible. And so they're like, no, no, no. As Muslims, we believe part of repentance is like, if you did something to harm another person you have to like get forgiveness from them if you took something from them you have to restore it you know you have to fix what you broke first then you're forgiven she's like really they're like yeah she's like i didn't believe them so i went and looked it up and found that this is a very normal and standard like uh, muslim belief and uh she became muslim and i got a wife mashallah any other questions <clears throat> بارك الله فيكم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته